Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to the Bonavera Discussion Group. My name is Lisa Sin, I am the Institute's Incoming Research Fellow. I have the great pleasure today of welcoming uh, Nick Lobenberg QC in person right next to me and Dr. Maria Jovanovic in, uh, via Zoom. Um, to briefly introduce them in turn, um, not much needs to be said, but briefly, Nick uh, is a barrister at 4BB Chambers in London and at One High Pavement. Nottingham. His expertise includes serious fraud, police law, serious sexual and violent crime, homicide and process of crime. Notably, he was counsel for Mr. Bukhari, uh, a case that we will be going into in some detail today. Dr. Maria Jovanovic is a lecturer at the Essex Law School, whose research focuses on human trafficking and modern slavery and the protection of human rights in the private sphere, including in the context of international business and global value chains. Maria's work on Section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act is well directed. In particular, she's been working with the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre, advising on policing surrounding Section 40. Uh, sorry, policy surrounding Section 45. Uh, Maria's got a book coming out on state responsibility for modern slavery and human rights law with Oxford University Press. That's coming out in 2022, so we can very much look forward to that. Um, both Nick and Maria are Oxford alum. Um, so actually, I should say a very welcome back as well. Um, let me just briefly introduce the topic that we're going to be speaking about, and then I will be passing over to our experts. Section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act provides that uh, there's a defense for adult victims of human trafficking if they can show that A, they were compelled to commit the offense, B, the compulsion can be attributed to slavery or the, uh, to some sort of exploitation, see that a recent person in the same situation having the accused characteristics uh, would have no realistic alternative but to do that act. Uh, in the case of children, it must be established that their actions are the direct consequence of their exploitation and that a reasonable person in the same circumstances with the same characteristics would do this act. Um, by establish, but establishing a defence under Section 45 of the Modern Slavery Act has become very difficult uh, by a recent Court of Appeal decision in Burkani. And to explain, I now hand over to Nick. Thank you very much, Nick. Good afternoon. Um, let's start by looking at the facts in Burkani. Uh, Kevin Burkani was a 17-year-old Albanian. He travelled to the United Kingdom in the back of a lorry. He first worked in Birmingham selling cannabis and then in South End he ran cocaine and money for a drugs gang. He ran a Section 45 modern slavery defence. In the course of the trial, he had a conclusive decision by the single competent authority that he was a victim of modern slavery, both in the United Kingdom and in Albania. In the trial, it was sought to get that evidence admitted and also to get admitted an expert social worker report that in essence said that he had the hallmarks of trafficked persons from Albania. Both the trial judge refused those, both of those applications. Uh, in the trial, uh, Kevin was cross-examined about his phone which will become an important feature when we get to the Court of Appeal. And on the phone, there are a number of things that were extremely unhelpful to him. He was joking in the lorry. He was seen to be entertaining escorts in Birmingham. He was joshing with his boss in the drugs gang, and he was posing with piles of money. On appeal, by the time the appeal was um, came before the judges, the decision in M, had been made. Now M was an admin court decision and it found that conclusive grounds were admissible. Case workers in the SCA were to be treated as experts and that was from a strong court of William Davis who's now been made into an LG and Lord Justice Singer. Now bizarrely it was William Davis that was the single judge who considered Bracani and gave it leave. And Bracani came before a very strong special court of the Court of Appeal with the Lord Chief Justice, the Vice President, and a very experienced criminal judge, Jeremy Baker. 
Now, how the case was argued, we basically ran M. We said the decision is plainly admissible. It's relevant expert evidence, including the hallmark evidence, which provides context and corroboration for decision makers who should be put in the best position to make decisions. And that we would say would, would have been, that's the identical position as in the civil cases, which we'll come to later. And thirdly, the Merton compliance test is an example of how um, social worker evidence on relevant topics is admissible. The Merton compliance test is if there's a dispute about somebody's age, you can go to an expert, the social worker's opinion is treated as expert evidence and is admissible. Now, uh, our opponent in the Court of Appeal was Ben Douglas Jones. He has argued almost all these cases for the last 10 years and has successfully narrowed and narrowed and narrowed the ambit of uh, this area of the law. He is a highly polished advocate uh, and the court like him. Now, there, the problem with Pakani is Pakani has hard facts, difficult facts for those that are defending, and the perfect facts for those that were prosecuting for the state. And Ben Douglas Jones had argued M and lost on each and every point in M. He ran exactly the same arguments in Brakani and one. So the judgment runs as follows. The SCA were not experts. The SCA were not compliant with the criminal procedure rule section 19. It's based on hearsay. They did, the expert, the social worker expert didn't have appropriate relevant experience. The conclusions were based on factual material that was defective. The same defects applied to both the SCA and the defense expert. M was wrongly decided. They copped out on the Merton compliance point and said it had been not argued, which was um, not exactly accurate. Uh, they avoided making any decision on the Bradshaw point. Bradshaw is the decision that in a homicide case, what a defendant says to a psychiatrist explaining their conduct is admissible before the jury. And so you could easily argue on a parallel argument that such material should be admissible for a modern slavery case. And in any event, they said the defense was, the words used was demolished by the phone evidence. Now, the reasoning of the court is worth looking at because they do take up some time dealing with, uh, as they see it, convention compliance by way of the NRM process. And what they say is that the CPS can go against the decision of the SCA if there's a good reason. Now, I'm, Maria's going to deal with good reason in some detail, so I'll leave that pleasure for her to deal with. But in this particular case, the Crown had a very easy good reason to use, namely the phone. Because the phone hadn't gone to the SCA, the phone hadn't gone to the expert. The reason for that was frankly due to COVID and the fact that it was deployed late in the case for various again COVID related reasons. In terms of M, what they said was that M was a case that turned on its particular facts because the Crown had made an admission that caused the problem. They had admitted the fact of the finding of the SCA and that admission having been made, that case must uh, be decided in the way it was decided. But it doesn't apply a general rule as to the admissibility of the decision. Well, the consequences of this are really extreme. And we're now going to look at the consequences. 
I am not an academic lawyer, I'm a practical trials lawyer. So what I've been doing recently is people have been asking me, well, where does Bracani leave us? How can we actually practically fight cases? And the answer is, it's, it's really difficult now. So firstly, let's first look at, I want to look at three issues. Firstly, experts. Experts have to comply with CPR 19, have detailed, clear experience as basis for opinion, be clearly briefed on all the facts. That's all trite law. They must be Turner compliant. So that is, has acquired by study or experience sufficient knowledge to render his opinion of value in resolving the issue before the court. That's the Australian uh, Supreme Court, New South Wales Supreme Court current best version of Turner. And it's got to be something outside the jury's knowledge and experience. So what the court said is specific relevant to generalities and hallmarks of Albanian trafficking. That's not enough. It's uh, not sufficient as the jury can apply their common sense to get an idea of what that's about. And in argument, they asked uh, Ben Douglas Jones, well, what, what kind of thing could you give expert evidence about? And he said, well, if you had debt bondage on a farm in South Vietnam, that would be so far removed from the jury's experience that it would merit the use of an expert. Uh, we then have to then deal with the, what in the value of the, account given to your expert is, if Bradshaw doesn't apply, uh, unless your defendant goes and gives evidence and is entirely consistent with all his previous accounts, the state will say, well, you're lying. And we go into the various, deploy, they will deploy that in front of the jury, regardless of what the law says, as a matter of fact. And they would say it's a matter of consistency. So you have real problem. They blocked off the NRM SCA decision going to the jury. If you want to get expert evidence, it is on such a narrow basis that it is difficult to see quite what will be admitted. Now, there is a case about to be argued this week, which will be dealing with experts, and hopefully getting some greater guidelines on when you can use them. Now, as to support for expert evidence, when you look at the civil division of the High Court, there are a number of very positive immigration and asylum decisions, which uh, say that it would be an error of law to make an assessment of credibility which doesn't take account of available expert evidence, including expert country, medical, both of which are capable of providing both context and corroboration for an account. For example, showing that an account was consistent with known patterns and indicators of trafficking. So though that is in Bibanga and uh, R versus Iraq, and sit, they're all on the case list which has been circulating. Secondly, in uh, RMM 2020 case that the opinion of a non medical witness with experience of the kind of trafficking in question to the effect that a putative victim's account was consistent with the account given by other established victims was of value and admissible in, pr in principle. Similarly, in RNAB, the High Court recognized that the opinion of an asylum support agency is likely to be of real assistance assessing whether a person is a genuine victim of trafficking. Referring to the, uh, particularly when you consider the significance of inconsistencies or delayed of reporting. Referring to the Secretary of State's own guidance emphasizing the importance and assistance of such expert material. Now what this means, and, and this I think is the first real absurdity of the position, you reach the following extraordinary position at present. This evidence appears to be relevant for those high court judges making decisions. But if you're in front of a jury in Merthyr Tidville, they are not to be uh, helped by this material. 
because it's all common sense. Now, make what you want of that, but it, it strikes me as being really unfair. Now, can I now go on to think about second point, discretion. Discretion. Now, the court do not have to wait for the NRM process to finish before pushing ahead with the trial. But the CPS have to make a decision to prosecute, to comply with their own obligations and guidance in this area. They, it may not be admissible as evidence in the case, but it is still the key issue in terms of exercise of discretion. Now, what does that mean? What can you do when you have a decision? In DS, which was also decided in 2020, the Lord Chief Justice said it could no longer amount to an abuse of process if the CPS took a contrary view to the SCA. However, it explicitly highlighted that a prosecutor must take into account a conclusive grounds decision in determination as to whether a defendant is a victim of trafficking for the purpose of assessing the evidential merits in prosecution in accordance with the guidance. And it goes on to say they're entitled to challenge those decisions before the jury, to invite the jury to come to a di different decision if there is a sound evidential basis on which to do this. It will not be an abuse of process to try. If there is not, it will still not be an abuse of process. So they're saying it's not an abuse of process, but the judge will consider any submission that there is no case to answer. The question I invite anybody to consider is what is the remedy? What is the remedy if the CPS try to proceed, give a half-baked reason? What can you do? The only way I think you can do it and it hasn't yet been tested in law, would be to go to seek to get the, them to put the reasons into paper and to perhaps look to try and JR the whole thing. But of course, you've, you've still got domestic remedies to be exhausted. So it's very difficult to see what the practical remedy is. Because if it's shorn of being a, a, an abusive process, which would have to be a sort of sui generis version of the piece of process, what are you left with to actually do? The last thing, and this is, uh, I, I slightly trespass on Maria's field of principle here. When they are arguing, the state argues that there is a difference between the decision made by the SCA and and the evidence held by the police. They have a responsibility to update the SCA as to what the evidence is. So you have one arm of the state saying, look, they didn't take account of this evidence, but whose job was it to give them that evidence? So you have one arm of the state relying on the non-provision of evidence, which was the state's job to give them in the first place, to then say, ah, we can prosecute. And that appears to me to be give rise to difficult issues when one comes to consider the convention rights and how this should be done. So Brakani is a real problem. It is Kafka-esque in many ways. The, uh, what you're left with in terms of getting material before the jury is narrowed enormously. Your use of experts are narrowed enormously. 
and you then are in a strange place where you actually have no remedy if the CPS do decide to prosecute you and, for example, it won't even give you the reason. So um, there we are, that's Brakani. And I have pleasure of arguing here. He obviously didn't do a very good job. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick, for those insights. Um, now, Maria, I'll hand over to you for uh, your excellent PowerPoint, which we had a preview of earlier. Thank you so much and hello everyone and thank you Nick for this really excellent and forensic analysis of the Burkani decision and I do indeed echo all your concerns. So I will focus in my address on three issues um, and to complement this analysis. So the first one is really about the non-punishment principle and how the decision in Burkani squares with the recent ruling of the European Court of Human Rights against the UK, the cases called BCL and AN. And uh, the, to explore basically the interaction between this so-called non-punishment principle, uh, which is um, embodied in section 45 in domestic legal system and the requirements that stem from human rights law. Um, the second one, and I think at the heart of this uh, analysis, is basically the requirement of victim identification and the role and responsibility of different authorities uh, in it, and the question of how to actually resolve disagreements. Um, and then the third one is goes a little bit beyond that and goes to, uh, uh, to explore what, how do we apply this non-punishment principle in cases when there is no dispute about victim status? And this involves three uh, issues. The first one is which offenses, to which offenses this defense does or does not apply? Um, what is the role of compulsion uh, and what is the difference between adults and minors? And the third one is the relevant nexus between the commission of the offense by alleged survivors of modern slavery um, and their uh, victim status. So uh, in the VCL uh, and uh, VCL and AN decision, the European Court of Human Rights was very careful to emphasize that the non-punishment of victims of human trafficking and slavery is not a requirement uh, that stems from the European Convention of Human Rights. In fact, it is a provision from another Council of Europe uh, treaty to which the UK is a party uh, called the European uh, Council of Europe Convention uh, on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. And the provision is very brief and does not really provide much substance as to the rules that govern its application. Um, so in BCL and AN, the court uh, basically said that uh, the punishment of victims of human trafficking uh, is possible. It is not incompatible per se with the convention. However, Prosecuting victims can sometimes be at odds with certain well-established obligations under the European Convention of Human Rights, and more specifically, the Article 4, which prohibits against slavery and forced labor. And there is a list of cases that are provided here, but basically there are three so-called positive obligations. The first one concerns putting in place the appropriate legal and administrative framework to prevent and punish human traffickers and protect victims. Um, the second one is to uh, put in place operational measures to protect victims or potential victims uh, of human trafficking. Uh, and the third one would be procedural obligation to investigate uh, those situations. And the court took an issue with the second uh, uh, duty. Namely, it said that by prosecuting uh, minors who were um, involved in trafficking, in uh, drug, drug uh, offenses, namely cannabis cultivation, the courts, uh, the domestic authorities did not really take into account their status as victims of human trafficking. Uh, and so the court went on to create certain rules here. Um, they said that, as I already mentioned, there is no general prohibition on the prosecution but it may sometimes be at odds with a duty to take operational measures to protect them. That early in the identification of victims by a competent authority is of paramount importance 
uh, in order for the prosecution of such victims to be compliant with the convention. And as Nick already mentioned, that even though the prosecutor might not be bound by the findings made in the course of such assessment, they would nonetheless have to provide clear reasons for that disagreement. So in effect, the court rightly put victim identification at the heart of the duty to protect them, um, which is rather self-evident. Um, and the question is now, could the Bracani decision be reconciled with this? Could we distinguish Bracani and how? Uh, Nick already mentioned, and I won't go into details, that the UK has put a system for victim identification to hold national, national referral mechanisms. And the, within that system, there is a special uh, authority called uh, single competent authority that makes decision on one's status as a survivor or victim of modern slavery. Um, and it involves two different decisions, the reasonable grounds decision and conclusive grounds decision. Uh, and in the previous cases, uh, this the courts had no issue with acknowledging that the competent authority is a specialist authority with particular expertise and knowledge. Uh, again, just to uh, repeat again, the VCL and AM decision against the UK said that the prosecutor could disagree, but they need to provide a clear reasons. And in this decision, in the VCL and AN, the problem was that authorities did not provide any formal reasons for disagreeing. And that was the issue for the European Court of Human Rights. And this was not the case in Bracani, as Nick has explained already. So I'll move to that now. So there are two really key considerations with Bracani. Bracani said, in Bracani, the court said, well, the caseworker's opinion did not take into account the material that was contained in the defendant's mobile phone. And therefore, uh, the decision was based on misinformation about the facts. So far, so good. Um, the court then went on even further to say that the caseworkers and the competent authority are actually not experts in human trafficking and modern slavery. And therefore, they, they're their, their statements were not admissible as evidence. So I think both of these uh, things are problematic. So the first issue is, what are the really the clear reasons? So we do know that the court gave in Bracani gave some reasons and they mostly involve the content of the mobile phone. However, a careful reading of the European court actually says that these reasons need to be consistent with that contained in the Palermo Protocol, which is another specialist instrument against human trafficking, and the Anti-Trafficking Convention for disagreeing with it. And there is further, uh, there are further points that the, you know, and these involve basically the elements of a trafficking offense. So not just any reasons, or even if they are clear for disagreement, the authority that disagrees with the single competent authority will need to apply the elements of the definition of human trafficking, which includes the certain act, certain means, and certain purpose, and need to conduct their own assessment and, conclude, and, and make the conclusion. I, and I think this is an important point. I'm not sure uh, um, what others would think of it. So that's the first thing, that not uh, any reasons would suffice. Um, the second point I want to make is that Really, I think the court keeps in their decision confusing two decisions uh, um, here. The first is whether a defendant is a victim of modern slavery. And then the status of a modern slavery survivor matter for, apologies for this, for their culpability. And whether, how does it matter for section 45 defense. And it seems that the reasoning confuses and conflates these two uh, questions along the way. So the section 45, um, Lisa also and Nick mentioned again, contains different criteria for adults and minors. Um, in the case of adults, it requires compulsion, that such compulsion is attributed to slavery. And then a reasonable person uh, in the same situation would 
have no realistic alternative uh, to doing that act. And in case of minors, uh, it's similar, but it's the, the element of compulsion is not present there. Uh, so, and the third thing, that third issue that I have with this judgment is really reach here. By trying to invalidate this one particular decision uh, of the single competent authority, um, the court made the much bigger statement that case workers are not experts in human trafficking or modern slavery and focused extensively on this whether their decision was admissible in criminal proceedings. And I think that in this case, the Burkani really uh, uh, tried to crack the nut uh, by using the sledgehammer, that it went way too far to invalidate a whole system of um, victim identification. Um, now, the disagreements between courts uh, or the prosecution, single competent authority, do not always need to be to the detriment of defendants. And we have a recent decision which was uh, uh, adopted after the Bekrani judgment, which acknowledged that first the court took an issue with the fact that the identified person as a modern slavery survivor. Um, and so the court made emphasize that lies and inconsistencies do not necessarily mean that the person has not been trafficked. A person can be found to have lied or been inconsistent, but nonetheless applying the balance of probabilities still be found to have been a victim. So this really invites, I think, to uh, uh, resolve the disputes between different authorities when it comes to the decision, the first part of the decision, whether someone was a victim of modern slavery or not. Um, once this is out of the way, there are certain questions to also consider and clarify when it comes to applying this principle when there is no dispute about uh, victim status. And there are three things here. The first is offenses to which this defense does or does not apply. The second is the nature and uh, role of compulsion. And the third one is the relevant nexus between the commission of the offense and relevant trafficking or exploitation. So I'll briefly go over, I'm not quite sure how much time I have left, but I will try to be very brief. So the UK Modern Slavery Act in Schedule 4 uh, contains more than from the statutory defense. Now, in their most recent evaluation report uh, of the UK's compliance with the Council of Europe Convention on Trafficking, uh, Greta, which is an expert body that oversees compliance, had a problem with this. They said that Section 45 excludes the possibility of withdrawing prosecution and punishment for this wide list of offences and was concerned that this gave a rather narrow interpretation to the non punishment principle and urge authorities to ensure that this provision is capable of being applied to all offenses that victims are compelled to commit. And this is the, the last part is key here because uh, there are additional requirements that need to be proven to, for the defense to kick in. And this, these involve compulsions. So Im immediately removing a vast list of offenses from that, even when there was a compulsion and relevant nex nexus, seems quite unreasonable to me. So when it comes to compulsion, I just want to reiterate that I already mentioned there are two sets of criteria for adults and minors um, here. And the, the, the guidance of the Crown Prosecution Service, the most recent version, says that the way compulsion applies is basically uh, by using this principle. The more serious defense, the greater the dominant force needed to reduce the criminality or culpability to the point where it's not in the public interest to prosecute. But there is not much more clarity about what the threshold really is and how this works in practice. Um, and when it comes to the minors, an interesting point is that the guidance says that compulsion is irrelevant insofar as a child's status of a victim is concerned. However, compulsion will be a relevant consideration when considering whether the public interest in prosecuting a child is satisfied. And that goes against, again, the 
the, the opinion and, and guidance provided by other relevant bodies uh, in international law. So, for example, the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons in their most uh, recent guidance provide that non-punishment provision will apply when the offense is committed by the child and was related to the trafficking and no other compulsion test should be taken into account. And indeed, uh, this is not a criteria in uh, other devolved um, parts of the UK. So in Scotland and Northern Ireland, compulsion does not feature when offenses are committed by minors. So that's another thing to consider and to reflect upon. Um, now, there is the, finally the question of the relevant nexus. And that I think is quite problematic again. Uh, the previous case law uses different uh, uh, wording. So Bracani uses sufficient nexus. Uh, the previous judgment uses reasonable nexus. Um, another decision uh, talks about direct causal link or very close nexus. And but the bigger problem here is that uh, they use the reasonable nexus and compulsion in a cumulative way. Not, they, not recognizing that they are in fact two different criteria or thresholds for applying this uh, principle. So I put a quote here from that in one of the decisions that they, 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 they first need to establish reasonable nexus and then apply the level of comp compulsion. However, in some other uh, guidance provided by international bodies, these are clearly distinguished as different criteria. Compulsion is the one used in the European Convention on Human Rights, but reasonable nexus is, for example, used in the ASEAN Convention on Against Human Trafficking. And it's been said that that latter instrument and causation-based uh, uh, application of non-punishment principle, in fact, is easier to prove and apply and is more beneficial to victims. So I put here certain uh, documents that outline this. So for example, the Working Group on Trafficking in Persons or the Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons emphasize this. So uh, yeah, I think I'm oh, maybe over slightly over my time. So this would be it. And I welcome any questions comments and criticism. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. No, that was absolutely perfect. Um, I just wanted to start off um, sort of allowing the audience some time to ask their questions. I thought it might be good to have um, a bit of a conversation between, um, I guess, the three of us. Um, one of the things that came up to that sort of throughout both of your um, remarks, to me at least, is that not only sort of is the law far from settled in this area, um, there's quite a lot of questions that have come up, but also there's quite a lot of practical elements of this that's not very streamlined. Um, Maria, perhaps over to you first. What do you think sort of needs to be done in terms of sort of the, the practical aspect as well as the law? I, I think sort of, you know, if you had a wish list, what would those look, what would they look like? Yeah, so I think I would focus on these three points. The really the to reconsidering the list of uh, offenses to which this defense applies or does not apply uh, in line with the request made by Greta and really clarifying the issues around compulsion and causation and relevant nexus. So are these cumulative requirements are these alternative? What, what do they mean? And what is a threshold really for what level of compulsion will suffice? And my, uh, my problem is, I think, with, with the courts and uh, the acting prosecutor in this string of cases is that they don't quite understand what human trafficking, modern slavery, the, the dynamics, the internal dynamics, and what that means. And so nobody really discusses, for example, the element which is considered uh, quite important in victim identification, and that's abuse of vulnerability. They seem to put the threshold quite high when it comes to compulsion, without considering that there are other uh, ways of controlling people. Um, so I think these three really are quite important issues to tackle uh, going forward. Absolutely. Nick, would you agree? Yes. Um, for me, I think the, the, the nexus issue is really a knotty problem, very difficult. And, uh, and the, what has seen, the, the British court seem to have adopted a cumulative approach 
and not actually analyzed the material into the relevant streams, which Maria has so clearly shown, which coming from different instruments in the international law have basically all been put in a blender in the Court of Appeal. And the problem is, I don't think it's a problem that, that the, uh, uh, the, the, the man that argues it doesn't understand it. I think the man that argues it understands it very well, but he's on a mission to narrow it down. If I could ask another question then, Nick, in this case, the, the facts as I see it and as I understand it for Bukhani is somewhat problematic. Um, where is it going? Um, will it be appealed? No, I don't think Bukhani would. There was an application to take it um, to the Supreme Court by a different team from Doughty Street and that was refused. The problem with Bukhani is the facts. Mm. And um, I don't think with these facts there's any prospect of having success in Strasbourg because of the reason argument. Uh, the phone is such difficult evidence. It means Bacani is not, it's not the right case to take, to be blunt. It's the wrong case to take upstairs because you'll lose. Maria, what's your take on that? Well, we discussed earlier before this seminar started that actually there is an initiative to kind of um, with three different cases being uh, heard before uh, the um, Court of Criminal Appeal, if I pronounce it as well, uh, on Wednesday, which I think will look into Bracani, even not formally, and consider to what extent that decision actually is compliant with the European Convention on um, on human rights, but I really, really, if I, if there is one takeaway, I think Nick's point earlier, um, the last point, the, the, the thing with evidence, with one kind of public set of public authorities sort of uh, uh, not really communicating with another one um, and kind of creating this kind of uh, um, radio silence and creating really facilitating then prosecution. And then another thing is also, which I think is not quite mentioned, is that the European the victim protection at the core of their analysis. Now the VCL and AEN was in fact the right decision because it was quite a, an easy case. In a local domestic authorities didn't provide any formal reasons for disagreeing. And so the court, the European court there focused on only on this first decision, whether someone was not, whether they were recognized or not as victims of modern slavery. Now, how that status then impacts on the later proceedings against that, it was not uh, the subject of the court's opinion. But I think that that part of the decision will, again, be informed by victims' protection needs. Uh, uh, that which stand above any other consideration. And that's why I put the thing at the start of my application that victim protection needs needs to be put above any criminal justice or internet uh, immigration uh, uh, law considerations. But yeah, I have no idea where this is gonna go in future. I mean, this is all incredibly fascinating to me. One of the things that stood out particularly from your presentation, Maria, um, that I thought really sort of hit the nail on the head was your um, cracking the nut with a sledgehammer analogy. Um, and I sort of looked over to Nick and he, was, he cracked a little smile. And I, sort of, I wanted to explore what, what was your take on that um, analogy, Nick? Uh, I think it's excellent. Um, they have, it, it's, it's the classic example of, you know, what is it? Hard cases make bad law, you know. I wish I remember this studying in jurisprudence here many, many years ago. Um, and, and it's a classic example of that. And, and the way I thought the way Maria analyzed it in terms of judicial overreach, the Bracani could have been decided in a much tighter way without causing the vast amount of damage it, it has caused. Uh, and instead we have general statements having been made which seem to have expanded the reach and narrowed the band of evidence 
And, and I, I see no reason why, if it is useful in a civil context in the high court, why it shouldn't be useful for a jury in a crown court, particularly when you would think that a jury is going to bluntly be less well informed than a high court judge. Maria, any remarks on that? No, I'm in full disagreement. So I wonder whether you should have invited someone who would be more argumentative and uh, defending kind of Burkani, but I do think it's indefensible and it's quite uh, Kafkaesque. So yeah, I can only agree. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A function and I'm not seeing any questions come through yet. So I, I'm sort of obliged to keep this conversation going based on my very limited knowledge and based on your excellent presentation so far. Um, one of the things that strikes me as, as important is the difference between um, how we treat adults and children in this case, in these types of cases. Um, when you mentioned that um, drug trafficking and also drug cultivation, especially of marijuana, is, is sort of a, an issue that's come up again and again. Um, in those cases, do we see competent authority, the, the single competent authority as being knowledgeable and well trained enough to be making the right calls? And this is now a sort of a more practical issue, moving slightly away from the law. Maria? Uh, well, I would. I have not analyzed in great depth the, num the these decisions of the competent authority, so I wouldn't be able to say that with confidence. Um, I do think that the problem really here is about, uh, you know, the concern of the government that this defense will be abused. And I think that's the position of the acting prosecutor and perhaps the court in, in, in this case, that there is that this defense is a vehicle for criminals to evade responsibility and that these minors are coached into what they need to say. And so on. And, and, and I think that concern informs in action around it. Now, whether that transpires in the decisions of the single competent authority, I'm not quite sure. As I said, there was one case recently decided where actually the single competent authority made a negative decision, but the court disagreed. They kind of, in that specific decision, they were looking at these lies and inconsistencies, and, uh, and they found based on that that the um, potential victim is not credible. And the court then uh, decided differently. So that might be an indication that even the single competent authority, the, the experts there are having this more uh, rigid view. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have details of that. No, and, and fair enough. I, I do wonder if we could tap into that particular, because it is a very interesting case and the finding against the single competent authority is very interesting. Is there anything you can share with us in terms of how the court came, came to that decision? Um, in terms of, you know, what factors did they consider? Well, I just think, that as Nick mentioned in the beginning, there was a similar case in uh, the M decision. And similar arguments were raised and simply, you know, different bench decided uh, uh, differently. So I feel that this all boils down to the extent to which different acting authorities are alert to the reality of modern slavery, to uh, the dynamics that exist between the traffickers or uh, slaveholders and victims and understand and, and are able to, to apply that when deciding that knowledge. That's, I mean, that's an excellent point that you've made, and I turn to Nick, is, it, is modern slavery simply too confusing for, for the court to grasp? Is it too different to human trafficking? Are the conventions out there difficult? Um, I, I, I think there is a, I completely agree with Maria, that there are concerns obviously being expressed and played upon that criminals are using this as a method to escape culpability. And that, that, that view is uh, articulated in it, was articulated in argument in Bracani. Uh, and the other uh, uh, issue that was also, which we haven't touched on, so uh, which reminds me, was the statistical argument, which features in Bracani, which is there is so much of this, the single competent authority is being overwhelmed 
the decisions are being really slow and we do need to keep the sausage factory of criminal justice moving. So uh, what you end up with is uh, that being used as a reason for, for, for bypassing what are in fact critical international um, obligations, which is pretty shocking. And, and they also, it was also adopted in it. That same argument has been, was run in front of Lord Justice Gross in the decision he decided. And he liked that argument as well. So the sort of volume argument, there's going to be so much of this, they can't cope, it's under-resourced, the decisions are too slow, therefore the criminal prosecutions all go into the long grass. So that's another aspect of it, but that's resourcing. You know, that's, if, if this is a state obligation, abide by it. It's not that complicated. And so resourcing to me sounds like a, a, a sort of practical issue on the ground. Um, would you say training is another one? Because I asked about sort of the indicators and what they make their decisions based upon. And it doesn't seem like there's any real, uh, I guess, guidance. Or, but there must be guidance. There must be some sort of CPA guidance. There, there is, there is guidance, there's guidance, but there's always lots of guidance. Uh, and there's guidance to the court in, and there's guidance to the court in the judicial uh, book, which is now online, um, which is really clear. I think the problem is that given the number of the way the decisions have been made recently, uh, in Bracani at first instance, the trial judge was extremely hostile I'm told. I didn't argue it at first instance but he was scoffing at the proposition that this man had, this boy had been trafficked. Absolutely scoffing. Uh, and if you have that attitude, that level of hostility before you start, something's going very badly wrong. But th there is an issue. There are Vast numbers of cases, uh, particularly of uh, possession with intent to supply, PWITs, uh, when I speak to my junior tenants, they're all doing it. Lots and lots of these people are running Section 45 defences, or trying to. And how's that going for them? Well, now, post Bacani, very poorly. Right. But I think the state would say, hooray. That's the problem. Mm. Um. Maria, can I ask you in terms of how you see that these sort of the I, I know you said you, you sort of don't have the exact details, but in terms of um, these practical issues, are they being addressed properly um, or can they be addressed properly given the international regime that we currently have, do you think? I know these are yeah. domestic issues, but what can what more can we see? utilize from the sort of the international sphere or the regional sphere? Yeah, so, well, the court in the U European Court of Human Rights is careful to distinguish between the non-punishment principle and the bigger kind of re requirements that stem from the European Convention on Trafficking and the European Convention on Human Rights. And so they centered on the protection. And so it will really depend on what the, on the type of cases that reach the court, when, to what extent this guidance will be further fleshed out and developed. And when it comes to this other convention, the European Convention, the problem there is that, um, you know, the, the provision is very cryptic. There is not much uh, guidance on it. And the grant as an expert body hasn't really published any uh, um, analysis. This, this question really started becoming more popular in the last couple of years, even though the prevention, the convention applies since 2005. So, um, yeah, I think there needs to be more guidance, more analysis, comparative assessment, because obviously uh, the UK legal system has certain rules and uh, the convention applies to uh, uh, 47 other countries which have different criminal justice systems. So I think their reluctance in providing clear guidance is potentially informed by the fact that it wouldn't apply equally in all these different jurisdictions. So they kind of let, let the countries uh, grapple with that on their own. But I think it's quite telling that, for example, Scotland and, uh, and Northern Ireland have a different approach, at least 
to some extent. So that's something that needs to be looked at and invites both further research and kind of policy consideration. I think that's a really good point. Is there, of, I mean, of all these jurisdictions that are subject to the, the European rules, do you know of a country that is doing really well in this area? Is there a, a model that we should be looking at? Or is the UK not alone in its poor performance? No, I think that's pretty much the standard. The problem really there is that there is a conflict that the person sim simultaneously occupies different statuses, that of a survivor of slavery, but often irregular migrant, and then we have criminal. Uh, uh, and so which there is this struggle to acknowledge which of the three statuses should have uh, a priority. And obviously it's quite clear in uh, uh, different jurisdictions that immigration issues and criminal justice issues always uh, take uh, precedence. And I think that's, that's the key problem here in protection. Mm -hmm. Certainly very problematic. Um, we are coming towards the end of our time and again given that um we don't have any questions from the audience um i just want to i suppose leave a few minutes for you, for you to make your sort of closing remarks um yeah. Nick, could i come to you first um in terms of how you sort of want to wrap this, wrap this up well um i think this has been a very interesting discussion i mean <laughs> between me maria and I, myself are on exactly the same page on Burkhani and the difficulties that it gives rise to. Uh, from, from my part, I'm concerned about the practical impact on the criminal trials process. But I think what's interesting about this crossover between the working lawyer and meeting the academics, which we probably don't do enough of, is to then see, look behind where we are and see the real difficulties in the principles that are not being thought that through, drilled down into by the courts when they should be. And, and that, that lack of oversight is concerning. I agree completely. Maria, um, your final words. Um, yeah, well, I think this is this is still an area which is very much in a state of flux. I don't know where how it will be developed, but I know for sure that there are two big issues with that. The first one is that it really undermines um, the government's efforts to address modern slavery, reflected in the establishment of the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Center and a lot of other initiatives. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that people who end up in prison uh, and who have suffered uh, from modern slavery, upon release, because they're usually uh, convicted for minor offenses, they get re-trafficked, they get back into the cycle. So this really doesn't help uh, addressing the problem. And secondly, even though I think the non-punishment principle really should apply for non-instrumental reasons, it should apply in order to protect victims from further victimization, uh, there are also some arguments, you know, from the, the fact that it undermines the prosecution of traffickers. So these people get convicted uh, and sent to prison without the original offense being investigated and prosecuted. So, you know, both, both these two things actually undermine the fight against modern slavery. So that would be perhaps my kind of final uh, uh, thank you, Maria. That, that's a fantastic way to end. You've both given me so much food for thought, and, and you're absolutely right. If we're really serious about tackling modern slavery, then we need to be looking at the root causes of it, not simply addressing kind of the, the surface level, um, the symptoms, so to speak. Um, so this does conclude our discussion group for today. Um, I want to thank Aradna, who's been working behind the scenes to keep things going, sending you relevant case lists and, and things like that. And of course, to our speakers, very knowledgeable experts, Maria and Nick. Um, if you would like to participate in the Bonavera's um, future discussion groups, keep an eye on our website um, and subscribe to our newsletter if you'd like to more, know more. Um, and I think on that note, we are good to end. So have a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.